Welcome back to my channel. I'm Brian Kafke. This is the fourth and final segment of an interview I did with deep dive technical expert Daniel Zafar. Daniel is a solution engineer who works with the Databricks top customers to solve their most difficult Databricks and Apache Spark problems. What we'll be talking about in this segment includes Delta Lake and why you need it, when to scale up versus scale out, what you need to know about streaming, Python user-defined functions, also called UDFs, and free Databricks learning resources. And I'll be putting in the comments, I'll be pasting a bunch of links that Dan gave me. And if I think of any that I can add to it, I will. So it's a great place to just get a lot of good information in addition to these videos. Let's jump in. Are there ways that uh, you within Spark SQL and the data frame to avoid shuffles? And I think you mentioned the query plan, uh, query optimizer was one of them. Yeah, I would say one thing that's really important is um, keep an eye on your joins and especially sort of like the types, like the join types that are going. So something that a lot of folks don't, don't realize that are using Spark is, um, um, you, know, you know, dig into the query plan some time and see what it's doing. Doing. So you just do like dot explain at the end of your um, command and it will generate the query plan. You can also in the Spark UI, if you go to the SQL tab, that is the best tab. Like that's the one that you want to be on. So you know, start at and then you know work your way around when you're trying to do performance operations. So when you're looking at the SQL tab, it'll, it'll show you all everything that's going on and um, make sure that your joins are going to be the, the right type of joins, especially like, for instance, there's some gotchas where like, let's say for instance, you had an or clause in your join condition, that's gonna generate a broadcast nested loop join, which is a really inefficient join. And people are like, wait, why is it taking me like two days to run this? Like, well, it's because you use this join. So like a sort merge join or shuffle hash, hash join. So, um, yeah, I would say like if if things are going wrong, like do your best to um, to you know analyze it in the Spark UI, see what it's running on, um, the query plans, and then um, yeah, I think that's probably the best thing. Nice. So this I feel like we talked about a little bit. So, uh, but I was talking about when to use Delta Lake Parquet and schema on reads. I, I, I think that's probably, you've already answered that pretty much. Usually your advice is use Delta Lake as much as possible. Uh, schema on read is to me, and I'll, I'll let you add to it if otherwise, but schema on read is useful if you just wanna read something in place like a CSV file, do some analysis. You may not always need to ingest it, but if you did, um, I think what you said earlier was use Delta Lake. Right, yeah. And so, I mean, the amazing thing that Delta, that Delta does is, is you know, Without Delta, like data lakes can quickly turn into data swamps where you have all this messy data all over the place. It's the wrong type. It's uh, the, the, the columns have null values and they're not accounted for. There's like nine, 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 nine in some of the rows yeah. and stuff like that. Just like, you know, messy stuff. So what, what Delta will do is like, it'll not only it'll, you know, help um, enforce schemas as they're being ingested into here and there, um, but it also sort of like, you know, you, you can add um, functionality to, you know, make sure that what you think is going into this column is going into that column, for like data quality checks. Um, and so, um, yeah, I would say like, if, if you can use Delta, which hopefully you should, I would, I would always use that. Um, and then schema and read um, can be, um, yeah, like you said, it, it, it's, it's really good for like, you know, um, EDA exploratory data analysis. Yep, okay. And something you said earlier, but uh, bears we mentioned, because when I think of like a SQL database, doing all the transaction logging is a huge amount of overhead and space, but the way Delta Lake does it, it's actually just like a little tag and it's it breaks up part the files by date. So it's actually not adding a lot of space or overhead. That, that You can explain that better, but that's what I understood. Yeah, yeah, completely. Yeah, the Delta log is really cool. Um, it's something where, you know, I never, you know, advise changing anything in the Delta log yourself because, you know, I can't even get it straight half the time. Um, but 
um, you know, you can actually go into it and read it. It's just JSON files and these other files are .crc files. Um, and basically all it is is saying like, okay, we added these parquet files. Okay, these parquet files are marked for deletion. Next one, okay, we added these parquet files. These ones are marked for deletion, blah, 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 blah. And it goes down, 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 down. And then once so once uh, something's been marked for a deletion for a certain number of you know hours, and you know it exceeds the threshold, you run the vacuum, the, the, the parquet files are deleted. And then also, I believe it's every 10 commits uh, to the Delta log, it will create a checkpoint file. And that checkpoint file will, um, uh, it'll obviate all of the uh, Delta log files that came before it. And everything gets kind of put into the one checkpoint file that's in your Delta log. So like what the Delta log will look like is like, you'll have a checkpoint file and then you'll have JSON, CRC, JSON, CRC, JSON, CRC, like one of those files for each of the commits, so. Yeah. So it's cleaning process. itself up as it goes and getting rid of the extra space. Okay. Exactly. And then you can configure it to do those uh, like different intervals or whatever. Okay. And this is, I think, the last technical question for it. But one of the things I see a lot in when I, especially at Microsoft, you always have to make that determination. When, in, when is it time to move out of the single server instance database like SQL Server Oracle? and switch to something like a scaled all platform, whether it's Databricks or Snowflake or something. And do you have any sense when you'd say, okay, this is a point where you need to really think about a threshold where you say, don't do this in a relational database, move to a scale all platform. Yeah, I would just say sort of, you know, when you're starting to hit those performance issues, um, usually what happens is like, you know, you'll be running with a single node uh, well, and you know, you think you're doing great because the appends are, you know, running like no problem. There's appending every hour, or every day, or something into that, and like, oh, it's it's working fine. Uh, but appends are fast, and then you go to to read it, and it's like, oh wait, this is taking me four hours to do like select star where or something, right? Um, so I would say like it's mainly going to be a performance thing. Like if if um, uh, I would say like if you you run a query and you go and you get some coffee and you come back and it's not like a crazy query like you're looking for this one row and the whole thing or something like needle and haystack if you go and get some coffee and come back and it's still running then it's probably time that you it's probably past time that you yeah. are moving to um, distributed systems. Nice. Yeah, I've I've seen a lot. It's tricky on the customer side a lot of times because. If you're speaking to salespeople at Google or Microsoft, they'll say, yeah, go to uh, Synapse, go to, and I used to say that a lot, they suggest it, even when the customer's just starting to talk about building a data warehouse or something. And uh, that cutoff, I always used to look at when you start to get into volumes like above 100 or 200 terabytes, it's worth considering. You don't always know, because sometimes you're building something new, so you can't test it too easily yet. Uh, mm -hmm. But to your point, Sometimes people jump to a scaled up platform before they may need to, because Azure SQL database can handle like four terabytes without a problem and usually do pretty well. But when you get to a petabyte, you know, you can't do it. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's also one of those things where, you know, if you're at the beginning of a project and you're architecting something and you think, you know, we're not going to need this scalability until like probably two years from now. Mm -hmm. So we'll just do it single node for now. I would say that's probably the wrong move because number one, like you're going to set it all up. You're going to have all these processes running uh, and then there's just going to get worse and worse and worse. And half the personnel that set it up are now gone. And um, people have other like a million other things to work on. You have to re architect this whole system. So I would say like, you know, if you're at the onset of a project, just, just make it scalable, right? Like it's, it's not, it's the same amount of overhead and you get scalability, you know, you're still going to be setting up something. Um, so, yeah. yeah. So that's actually my question, but I did, I had one thing that was picking up on what you mentioned as uh, you mentioned that a pain point for customers is often in the area of streaming. And uh, I don't know if you remember, but if you want to add to that, what you meant by that. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, I feel like streaming is one of those things where it just, 
um, a lot of the issues that I look at are end up usually being streaming uh, based. And I think, you know, that's also an artifact of, of um, these are jobs that are, um, most of our customers are, are going to be using streaming applications. Um, and they're sort of running all the time. Um, so there's probably a lot that are, you know, going well, but um, the, what the streaming API is, is basically it's the batch API with like, and some additional bells and whistles on it that allow it to do um, just run continuously. So it's batch, but it's just batch after batch after batch after batch is sort of how it's set up. It's like in micro batches, right? And so I think the thing that gets difficult about it is that um, there's a lot of different options and different configurations depending on the data source that you're pulling from. So like, let's say you're streaming from a Delta table. Right, so that means like your upstream is a delta table. Maybe you're doing some transformations and joins, and then you're writing to a delta table. There might be options and things that you can use there that aren't going to be available if you're streaming from Kafka, for instance. Right, um, like for instance, uh, there's a really cool um, config that you can use. It's called um, max uh, file size per trigger. I believe that's what it's called. Yeah. And so with that one, you can sort of tune like how big your batches get, which is nice because if like your ingestion uh, is, is, you know, cyclical throughout the day, like you get everything at 5 a.m. and then sort of tails off and then starts to come up again when everything's at, you know, back to 5 a.m., they can handle things like that. Mm -hmm. Another really big problem is that right now um, we don't recommend using auto scaling with. I mean, this is a databricks centric issue, right? But we don't, you know, recommend using auto scaling with streaming because it can it can cause issues, um, and so that's another big pain point too. Um, and there's been a lot of work that's been gone into, like how do we make it adaptive so that customers aren't just going to be burning, you know, um, burning money on you know VMs that are just sort of sitting and not really needed except for during these times when there's really high capacity um, of you know of data coming in um but yeah i guess what would be my advice there um there's some really good talks on streaming uh td who's sort of like sort of like the father of spark streaming he invented these streams which eventually became um structured streaming and then there's stateful streamings um I would say like, you know, try to understand sort of um, what's going on under the covers there and um, understanding what, what happens in the checkpoint file is really useful as well. So yeah, is there anything else I should sort of touch on there? No, I think that's good. I just, uh, I remember you mentioned it. I was asking sort of like what pain points you hit. I don't know if there's any other pain points that you wanna bring up to say, well, this is something that customers are always asking about or getting into trouble with. Yeah, I guess it's tough because I would say like where the customers are, the questions are going to be really different. And you know, I'm I'm fortunate enough, I'm I'm fortunate enough to work with like some of the really really smartest people in Fortune 500, and then also just work for people that are like literally it's their second month coding in Spark. Mm -hmm. So um, the questions are sort of all sort of all over the place. Um, uh, so, but I would say like, if I had to give one sort of thing or to be, um, yeah, I would say just like, I'd probably just advocate for using pandas VDFs again. That's the one thing where they'll say, oh, this isn't working. This is so slow. I'll be like, have you used a pandas UDF with it? And they'll be like, oh, what's that? And then I'll show them the documentation and either they'll say, oh, that's so cool. And then that's it. Or they're like, oh, this is complicated. You know, can you help us? <laughs> I'll go in there, spend an hour or something, and get them chugging and like, wow, this is amazing. You know, so just remembering that sort of like pretty much anything that you need to do in Python, you can translate that to a pandas UDF and just run it. So, so what were they doing as opposed to that? Trying to run it all within like a query and process it as opposed to writing a function they could push to the to the nodes. Yeah, like trying to run it all in this in the Spark API, okay, with the like dot apply or something, um, yeah. or yeah, or or just trying to use like the sort of the column API, 
to to do things and it's, it's just pants is just made faster mm. nice yeah are there any other uh tips comments anything you'd like to add uh to cover a lot of ground yeah we sure did um i think i would say um one thing that databricks does really well for the spark community is we really put out a lot of information so um attend summit uh, i mean it's a little bit too late you know with this interview summit just happened but it was free you know this year and last year's because of you know, you know the covid situation but i would say you know um all i mean we there's so much good material out there um and it's all for free like you can listen to any talk you want from any summit any year and it's, i've it's done that that's how i got ramped up on databricks yeah. YouTube on all the previous videos. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, if, if you're like, what? I mean, they're talking about Delta Lake, but I don't really get it. What is it? Like, you can go listen to Mike Ambrose talk uh, when he presented it in, I think it was 2018. Yeah. You know, I saw uh, that. <laughs> or if you're like, oh, you know, I want to get a little bit more knowledge about streaming. Well, you can go listen to all of TD's talks. You're like, oh, I, I really want to work on performance optimization more. I wish I was better at that. Uh, uh, Daniel Tomes, he's he he's an RSA uh, at Databricks, uh, resident solution architect, and working some really difficult big accounts. And he has an amazing talk on performance optimization, which uh, it was like my bible for a long time. You know, I'll have to get those so, links. I'll post them in this video uh, later. Yeah, that'd be great. That's an mm -hmm. area that I found particularly difficult with Spark is just getting good. I've seen a couple of presentations on performance tuning, but not a lot that really gets into a sort of how do you approach it and things to look at and how to analyze, for instance, even the query plan and what you're looking at and all that stuff. Uh, so yeah, that, that's good stuff. I, I have a spark book that's the definitive guide, but things have moved so quickly that it's out of date. Now it talks all about RDDs and I'm like, that doesn't help. Oh yeah, definitely yeah. not, yeah, completely. Yeah. But cool. There's also, I'll, I'll throw in too, uh, Microsoft has Microsoft Learn and they have like a, a sort of interactive step through training for Azure Databricks, which uh, that's something I'd worked their way back, but that's actually another place that people can do more hands-on training. But yeah, any later on, we can put links uh, below and I'll put that in the video so people can follow up. I want to thank you for watching this segment of the video with Daniel Zafar, a deep dive technical expert, software engineer for Databricks. I'm Paul and Foy. We're all in this together.